governments, right? Uh, so in 1974, Xerox um, basically came up first with a mouse interface that later led to, you know, the, the invention of the Mac and, you know, the personal computer and the popularization of the personal computer like we know it. And basically, this brought the computer to each and every house and kind of opened a huge market. And you have, um, you know, um, Mac in 84 and 87, 88, we started seeing it's like early business applications. So and people say, wow, we can do, create some, you know, really improved businesses, improved processes in business. By using software, we have an app that people saw, we could talk about that, uh, which were kind of the big, first big uh, business applications. Then in 1990, uh, something huge happened. So this guy over there invented the internet. Uh, really invented the internet, or kind of the internet that we know today. Um, and again, the, the booming of personal computers. Uh, then 1994 came the browser, and uh, kind of put the, the internet in each and everyone's house, in some sense. Um, later, the dot-com boom, too much excitement, and like, huge chaos. Um, Web 2.0 and the iPhone, and I'll talk about why the iPhone is very, very important to the future of computers. Uh, in a couple of moments. But what we can see is that you know, it took kind of like really 80 years to get all this done. It seems like it's the last couple of years, but it took like 80 years to get from the first notion of software, first notion of computer, to where we are today. 
So the question is what now? So, you know, uh, all of us use software, and the question is, uh, you know, why, why is software so important? And I know that Fjord sent out a link. Uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to, to read it. Is that Fjord? Yeah. Who sent? <laughs> anyway, if you, if you had a chance to read it, it's, it's basically an article uh, by a guy who called Mark Anderson. This Mark Anderson guy is the guy who basically created the Mosaic browser together with another team and then kind of commercialized it uh, to Netscape, which was kind of the first popular browser. And uh, what was interesting in this article was that he said the software is eating the world. And what did he mean by the notion of software is eating the world? Um, so let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, have you heard about Borders? No? You heard about it. Uh, basically, Borders is a huge, huge uh, bookstore uh, in the United States. Huge chain. Uh, just just went bankrupt, which is really, really, really sad to see. So you walk around the border stores with a huge, we are closed and everything must go out and 90% discount and all this books. Uh, and, you know, it was a huge, huge retailer, a huge business in the United States. And then came Amazon with the notion of selling books over the internet. And Borders was so sure that it's not going to happen that actually uh, in 2001, they told Amazon, they gave kind of Amazon the, their license to sell digital books. Uh, the result, well, you know how big Amazon is today, and you know uh, where Border is, because I told you it went bankrupt. Same thing happened to Blockbuster. Blockbuster was selling DVDs, you had to go to a store to buy it, right? You have to date Netflix in the United States, although they're not doing that good in the last month or so, uh, but they'll recover. And uh, what Netflix did, they just used software to replace the old world, you know, brick and mortar model. Uh, another Fun example is Pixar. Uh, so you know, Disney kind of was a monopoly on animation movies or animated movies that were all created kind of manually. And then came Pixar and was doing the first real full feature animated movies. And basically, it went to the point where Disney, in order to stay uh, relevant, had to buy Pixar, pay a lot, a lot of money, making Steve Jobs even more rich than what he is because he was kind of the biggest investor in Pixar. But again, it's a software company that you know, comes in and competes with a huge old school company and kind of, you know, kind of takes over the world in this specific industry just by writing lines of code. You have to remember what we do here is writing lines of code, if I try to simplify it. Skype is another example, the fastest growing telecom company today. Uh, CenturyLink, which was a huge company in the United States, losing market share every month, and nobody knows if they'll even be around in the next couple of years. Again, software that is you know, taking out the old incumbent in the market. Um, and, and another fun example is Spotify, which you must know very well, uh, not in the United States because it's pretty recent. But Spotify and Pandora, that, and basically, even before that, all the music industry that moved to digital format and killed tower. So we see here kind of a, a theme that is repeating itself, like old school ideas, old, well, old school companies, retail companies, brick and mortar companies that you know, are being replaced by software companies, which is a huge thing. So this is uh, basically what happens today, uh, and I hope this makes you understand why, um, why software is so important. And software is going to get only more and more important, and the question is why, and what will be the forces that, that shape you know, uh, uh, this future of software. So what I did here is I came up with kind of four, four forces, or, or a notion of four concepts, that I think are going to be very, very important uh, in the future. Um, and and it's, it's a, for me personally, a lot of fun to talk about it. So first, machine learning. Everybody heard that, about that before? Machine learning? Okay, one, two. Uh, okay, the notion of data. Okay, in 2010, the amount of digital data that humanity created was 800 exabytes. Okay, this was in 2010. In the next 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, we're going to be in 53 zettabytes that, you know, roughly 70 times the amount of the whole amount of digital data that was created until 2010. Um, my wife asked me, because I, you know, when I heard, first heard about that, she asked me how much is 53 centibytes, I thought her it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I had no other way to describe it, but um, 
But the notion is that, okay, you have all this data, now what is going on with the data? Well, if you're using software, we can do like really neat things. Because it's one thing that software can do that people cannot do is compute and you know, analyze huge amounts of data uh, in, in a short period of time. Um, so there are a lot of algorithms that, you know, starting the day of artificial intelligence, but stuff like decision trees, if you wonder why I'm in the background of trees here. Uh, so decision trees and neural networks and all these kind of things that help software companies make better predictions of what people need. So a very simple example of that is Amazon's ability, and Amazon uses this algorithm to tell you what is the next books you love. Uh, another example is Netflix's ability to come and tell you what is the next movie you like. And actually, Netflix ran a competition for $1 million to people who would be able to improve their recommendation engine. Uh, now, going forward, you can imagine all the services that we have today. Um, I, I mean, it might sound freaky, but, you know, many things that are happening today are kind of freaky. But maybe Facebook will tell you who your friend should be, right? <laughs> but it might happen. Uh, maybe Yelp will tell you where you should eat your dinner. Uh, maybe, I don't know, um, I'm trying to think like, that, you know, a hiring website will tell you where you should work. I have a good, have a good answer to that one. Uh, I don't know who you are. Uh, but, but basically the idea here is that, you know, people are talking again and again about the idea of information overload, right? And, and we know that. Uh, you know, I think that a couple of startups, a couple of the pitches we heard here before are trying to kind of address this issue, right? How do, we, how do we manage all this information that comes to us? And this kind of algorithm that to take this amount of information and really summarize it for you and, and basically give you the decision, right? So uh, kind of package it to you, shorten it, and tell you this is what you should do. Uh, and, and kind of minimize the amount of choice that you have to make because choice uh, equals frustration. Uh, Questions so far? Okay. Uh, the next idea is the slash of family name. I'm not, I'm not from the United States originally, but you need to computing, I guess. <laughs> but the notion here is that, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you had this notion that there is a computer, and in order to uh, do stuff, uh, I don't know, the internet or use applications, you had to go somewhere. You know, and it was, okay, you had a computer in your home, so you go to your home, you sit in front of the computer, but this is this destination, right? But today, not many people understand that, but, you know, and I guess you, you do, but the iPhone is a computer, it's a full featured computer. And I don't want to discriminate here, so Android as well, but Android based phones. This, this uh, new type of mobile phones, and this is why the iPhone is so important uh, and when it was released. These new types of mobile phones are full featured computers that have just uh, enough computing power and enough memory to do really complica uh, complicated stuff. And when you start to think about it, there are so many other computers around us. So any one of you knows Nike Plus? Right? So this is you know, another, another good example of taking, you know, bringing computers to you. So we are in, a, and I'm even not starting to talk about all the tablets that you'll be, you know, carrying everywhere, and people talking about watches and, and crazy, you know, kind of, of stuff. But the main main idea here is that people will stop thinking about a computer as a device, so something that you have to reach out to because whenever they want to do something, they'll be able to do it. Right? We already can see today in mobile phones, you basically can do almost whatever you want, stuff we couldn't imagine, um, just by using it. Uh, so this is the idea of ubiquitous computing, and actually it leads to the next uh, uh, notion, which is, I think, really huge. And, uh, and the idea, this idea is, uh, at least in my mind, uh, four days old. Uh, but, uh, um, and it's, it's really simple, when, when you hear it, it, it might, as I'm obvious to you, but suddenly what we're seeing today and what we're talking in our company, kind of stuff we're talking about, is uh, the decoupling of interfaces from you know, actual software, right? Because of all these devices that you have, suddenly it doesn't have to be that the software and the, and the interface are in the same place. 
Uh, and what I mean by that, and I can give you a couple of examples. Again, I'll take Netflix because it's a great company uh, to use for that. Netflix is a video company, it's a software company that has one place where it has all its data and, and storage and application, but has many devices that can access it in the United States, right? Spotify is another great example for that. So Spotify is a company that, it's a music company, right? It's a web company, an internet company that has no web interface. You have mobile interface, you have Mac clients or Windows-based clients, but you don't have a web interface. So there's this decoupling of the idea of like, Software and the interfaces don't have to be in the same place. And now the software in, in our era is kind of mostly, and you know, it's, it's just going to be more and more so based on like on the cloud. Although I hate this uh, buzzword, with many many devices accessing it, which means that interface becomes the most important thing. Which leads to the next notion, um, and it's my favorite one. Uh, and it's the idea of user experience. Um, so, unfortunately, um, I don't want to insult here uh, developers, but unfortunately developers were kind of determining what, are the, what is the user experience that is going to be. And what they knew is forms and databases. So there's a database and there are forms and we'll feed these forms that will go into the database, right? Uh, however, this is not how people think. And you know, people don't naturally uh, wake up in the morning and say, Oh, I'd like to fill a web form today, or a form to <laughs> software today. Um, it's not just a natural thing that we think about. So, what people do have in their mind, it's kind of mental models. Mental models like, how does the world work? And what we want to do in software is give them the same mental model. So, I'll give you a very simple example of that. Uh, the trash being in most of operating systems, right? Have you ever thought about it that it's trash, like trash in the physical world? So the idea of that is pretty much simple. By calling it a trash, people know that whatever they want to get rid of, they can put there, right? Just like in the physical world. So this is like giving good feed to the mental model that people have. Um, and you see that mainly when you're working with small kids and, and elderly people. Uh, because the way you think about a computer, or how a computer should be, not like us, we're kind of pretty much integrated into computers in our thinking, right? But all people who haven't used computers before, small kids who haven't used computers before, find some of the concepts that we are using today really, really confusing. Uh, my best example of that is I had to, I had to teach my dad, um, he's 80 years old, uh, and he decided that he wants to know what this internet thing is, and it was a disaster. But basically, uh, he wanted to do like, you know, different stuff in, in his bank interface or whatever. So I'm teaching him the computer, how to use the computer and how to use the mouse because he didn't do that before. And I tell him that you have to bring your mouse here, right? And I point, I point on the screen. So he takes the mouse and he puts it there. <laughs> because this is how people think. I mean, and, and this is, again, if I come back to the iPhone, why do kids that are three years old find the iPhone to be so easy? Because it's, it's just, whatever you want, you just click it. If there's no pointing device. The pointing device is your hand, which is very natural to people. Um, and if you see this guy doing his, his magic, but uh, this guy, uh, uh, John Underkoffler, uh, basically did in TED, uh, he showed that the interface for Minority Report, you remember this interface? Where you just take the pictures and move it. So he shows that it's already existing. And he actually shows that you see the gloves on his hands are kind of the interface and he uses them to move stuff. Mm. Now, the funniest thing about that was that for me, that when I saw that, I got really excited about it because I got really excited about user experience stuff. Uh, and people told me, oh, come on, that's like 40 years down the road. But it's the same people who, when I saw the, uh, uh, the, the guy who gave us an example of how he uses a screen, right? So I'm talking about the touch screen. Told me, yeah, it would take 40 years, and two years later we had the iPhone using the technology that the guy actually uh, showed. So, what I'm trying to, to say here is that I, I think that in the future of software, that's one of the biggest revolutions. And, and the idea is that you know, now we can start using all these devices and using all these you know, smart technologies, create new user experiences that were not existing before and they just couldn't, couldn't have before. So, I encourage you kind of to think you know, uh, past the, the form. Okay. 
how we kind of used to that. And when you look at all these kind of things, and this for me is the most exciting thing, uh, taking all of this and thinking about uh, you know the, the era that we're living in, you know, there's, you know, there's just one sentence that I really like. Um, and uh, so the, the only thing we learn from history is that we never learn from history. And, and basically the notion here is, is, is this. So you heard about the Industrial Revolution, right? So today there's the concept of this Industrial Revolution and everybody knows it. But you know what? Guess what? The people who lived uh, uh, you know, during the Industrial Revolution had no idea that they were living in the Industrial Revolution. In fact, the name Industrial Revolution was invented only 70 years after the Industrial Revolution has, you know, finished. Or this, you know, this period that, that was defined like that was finished. And I guess maybe the main point that, you know, I'd like, I'd like to, to convey today is that maybe we are not understanding that. But I think that 80 years from now, 70 years from now, there will be this historian that would call this the Internet Revolution, or the Information Revolution, or the Software Revolution. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's something we're living through that is huge. And if you're not in software, um, I urge you to be. <laughs> Thank you.